begin by doing an acknowledgement of country. So we'd like to acknowledge the Nandari people, who are the traditional owners of the land of which we meet today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So my name is Kevin Mika, and I'm the Community Services Manager at Light Regional Council. And on behalf of Council, I'd like to welcome you here this evening, um, and we're excited to be co-hosting this event with the History Council of South Australia. So it's fantastic to be able to have uh, something of this calibre coming out to our region. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, the toilets are located just out in the foyer, um, to my right uh, there. Uh, at the end of the evening, there will be some drinks and nibbles available, so there will be the opportunity to mix and mingle and um, maybe chat with Melanie or um, Julian from the History Council, as well as some students that we have here tonight. Um, tonight you'll have the privilege of hearing from Professor Melanie Oppenheimer and her lecture on Vivian Bullwinkle and the Baker Island Massacre, um, 80 years on from that event. Um, but just a couple of words first on Vivian uh, Bullwinkle's connection with Kapanda. So she was born in Kapanda in 1915, uh, before going on to do her nursing uh, in Broken Hill. Um, that part of her life on from here, Melanie will certainly give a good overview there, but in recognition of Sister Vivian Bullwinkle's um, service, uh, on the 13th of July 2000, um, His, Ex His Excellency Sir Eric Neal, Governor of South Australia at the time, um, unveiled a bust of Sister Bullwinkle, which is located in the War Nurses Memorial Gardens just down in Dutton Park. For the locals that are aware, if you're um, not familiar with the area, it's um, a few hundred metres just down the road. Um, and also, those gardens were developed by the community to commemorate the service of nurses during the times of war and uh, conflicts that Australia was involved in. Um, on this same day, a monument uh, was unveiled in honour of her service uh, who served in Australia, who served Australia in times of conflict. Uh, and for those that aren't aware, the monument is um, uh, located in the Cenotaph in the RSL building, just sort of at the top of the main street there. Um, unfortunately, uh, Sister Vivian Bullwinkle believed that she was due to attend those uh, ceremonies, but uh, she passed away 10 days before that occurred, so um, a little unfortunate there, but at 84 um, years of age, and uh, certainly lived a good life there. Or not so good necessarily, parts of it. Um, and I'd start, like to start by introducing Elspeth Wright, who's a Churchill Fellow, and she's going to acknowledge uh, some of the South Australian secondary students who are here tonight, who are recipients of the 2022 Premier's Anzac Spirit School Prize winners. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce three students we've got here with us tonight. So we have Gemma Mann. Thank you very much. 
and Heather, um, thank you for all you've done um, to make tonight possible because, you know, organising an event um, at, a, at a distance like this doesn't, just doesn't happen unless you've got people doing all the work actually on the spot, so thank you so much. Um, I'm now, I'm not gonna, we're not going to spend a lot of time because, you know, we've, uh, we, we want to hear from Melanie, not, not a lot of stuff from me, but I do want to tell you about the History Council. You've got brochures on your, on, uh, some of your chairs there. The History Council um, uh, is a sort of umbrella organisation that speaks on behalf of all history and heritage issues, not only South Australian or Australian history, um, but that's, that is the main interest of many of our member organisations. So we either have, we have both individuals and groups as, as uh, members, so, so historical societies can join the History Council as, a, as an organisation. We, uh, we offer a, a, a fortnightly newsletter where we can publicise, um, you know, anything of interest to the history community and um, spread the word, we offer advocacy for the history community uh, and one of the things that we love doing is having these regional lectures. Last year we were in Murray Bridge um, and this year we are in Thunder, which is fabulous. I'm not sure where we'll be next year, we'll have to be talking about that. So uh, please do think about joining the, the History Council if you're, if you're interested um, in keeping in touch with history the rest of the history community in, in South Australia. Um, it, it's a very modest um, contribution, a very modest subscription. Um, so uh, have a look on the website um, and, uh, and uh, join us. But the main business of tonight is to welcome uh, Professor Melanie Robinheimer. Now I met Melanie about nine years ago when she came to Flinders University and uh, we had, uh, I was at the time the Special Collections Librarian at Flinders and, and uh, immediately I thought, my goodness, this is someone fabulous to work with because she had all these innovative ideas about working with archives and students and things like that, so, which um, I've been trying to get, get some traction with, but Melanie came to me with ideas, so it was brilliant. Um, so, and Melanie's now, um, She's, she's, been, she's done a lot of research on the Red Cross, on uh, the concept of volunteering, not only in wartime, but um, more generally. Uh, she gave a brilliant oration last night at St Mark's College, uh, John J.C. Dunn, an oration about volunteering and the state of volunteering in Australia at the moment. And, um, and uh, so she's now at the ANU um, as a learned emeritus. <laughs> they are very lucky to be graced by her, um, by her, um, by her presence. Um, anyway, so I, I won't say any more. This, this, it's easy to uh, find a lot of information about them. I mean, if you Google her, <laughs> uh, but the best thing is to listen to her speak. So let's do that. Nurses and nursing history. 
But I'm not an expert on Vivian Bullwinkle and her life, and there have been many historians and journalists um, who have written about her. Uh, there are biographies, uh, Lynette Silver has done some recent work uh, about Barbara Angel, etc. Um, her friends, fellow nurses, fellow prisoners of war have written about her. Um, and also Japanese historians more recently have also um, engaged with her, uh, which I will talk about um, through my talk. However, so what I want to do tonight um, is to discuss the massacre. And I have to say that some of, um, nothing that I'm going to say per se is distressing, but I just want to sort of just to warn you that the, the whole kind of, a, a lot of what, what is, you know, what happened to the uh, people is, is, um, is distressing. Um, but I want to discuss uh, the massacre, Vivian Bullwinkle's role as the sole survivor, um, place the event within a broader context of World War II, and particularly women's roles in war. Um, and then I want to comment about why it's important to remember and to commemorate the White Bank Island massacre, and the importance of remembering our wartime history more generally. Um, and I've prepared um, a PowerPoint, so I hope you can see up the back. Um, it's always good to have some images to look at. And of course, here's a couple of my books. Um, but I first wrote about Vivian Bullwinkle um, in the Department of Veterans Affairs book on the left, which is called Australian Women and War, published in 20, uh, 2008. And I really wanted the gig to write this book because I wanted, I had something specific that I wanted to say. I wanted to focus on what women actually did uh, during wartime, not uh, what historians would like women to have done, <laughs> uh, or what historians more recent decades consider important. Um, and I also recently uh, finished a, a book, and this is Oceans of Love, which is actually my favourite book. Um, of mine, which is about a World War I nurse, Narelle Hobbs. Um, that, that's a story for another time, but it is a really fascinating uh, story um, of a particular Australian nurse who did um, pretty uh, amazing things. Now, I became irritated in the early 2000s, I love to <laughs> when it was realised that most of the generation of World War I leaders had passed away and hardly any of them were participating in Anzac Day marches. That original Anzac generation was um, rapidly disappearing, and probably many of you will remember that. So we, as a nation, led by the Department of Veterans Affairs and the media, and politicians, we began counting them down. Many became household names, and some were given or offered state funerals. Well, their families were. So there was Charlie Nance in 2001, Alec Camden in 2002, Ted Smout and Marcel Coe in 2004. And in 2009, at the age of 110, Jack Ross died, and he was the last of 416,000 Australian men to enlist for service in World War I. But what about the nurses who served in World War I? Did we as a nation count them down? Did we even remember that they had passed away? Why were they treated differently to the men? So we actually don't know who the last Australian nurse was to die from World War I. So I tried to find out. And I concluded that Mary Britt, Need Marshall, Mary Marshall, who died in 1998, aged 103. She came from Gippsland in Victoria, she died in Sydney. And according to her daughter, her mother was allowed to have the Australian flag draped on her coffin, but they were not offered a state funeral. And actually, just a couple of weeks ago, I received an email from Mary's great-granddaughter thanking me for my work on trying to bring her great-grandmother's service and all the other women that they represent, all the other nurses, to the public's attention. So I'm, I'm mentioning this now because 
Let's hope we don't forget the Australian service women from World War II, where as they pass on, as we gear up for the centenary of World War II, which is just around the corner. Okay, and maybe these young young folk in the front row will be really you'll be front and centre of it in 20 years' time. Okay, it's coming. So why is World War II different? I think World War II is different for mm -hmm. women. And I, I, that's why I think we will remember them. And I hope you can see that at the back. Um, but, and I will go through uh, different services. So it's different for women in World War II because of numbers. For a start, more than 66,000 women enlisted in the auxiliary services during the Second World War. At the outbreak of the war, the only women's service was the Australian Army Nursing Service which we can all be more joined, and I'll come back to that in a moment. There was a special nursing service for the RAAF formed in July 1940. That was the first of, um, of the women's auxiliaries. <clears throat> and I think this is what Vivian tried to join initially, but she was rejected due to her flat feet. Her younger brother had enlisted in the RAAF. It's the most sought after service and has the most glamorous reputation. And over 600 nurses from the RAFs uh, nursing uh, served in World War II, both in Australia and Papua New Guinea. The next cab off the rank was the Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force, that of the WAFs, that followed in February 1941. <coughs> so this is about 18 months into the war. The Pacific War hadn't begun yet, but the government is faced with an increasing shortage of manpower. So with enormous reluctance, the government did not want to do it, but they had no choice. They decided to introduce women into the armed services. Basically, the, the, the women's place was a domestic one, but the Air Force, Navy and Army desperately needed, they needed wireless telegraphists, and there was simply not enough suitable men to go around. This announcement was followed by the creation of the Women's Royal Naval Service, the RANS, in April 1941. This was the smallest of the women's auxiliaries. Over 2,000 women became RANS during the war. They didn't serve on ships and they didn't leave Australia. The next one was the Australian Women's Army Service, followed in August of 1941. AYs were not allowed to serve outside of Australia. This was a rule that later changed and around 24,100 women enlisted in the AWARS. The last women's auxiliary to be formed in World War II was the Australian Army Medical Women's Service for the AWARS in December 1942. The Army was already employing hundreds of Red Cross voluntary aides, both in Australia and overseas, from 1941. And the creation of the AWARS was a way for the Army to take administrative control of a huge pool of voluntary labour already operating within the military system, medical system. Towards the end of the war, Anwar served in New Britain, Bougainville, Moratai, Borneo, and later Japan. And over 7,800 Anwars officially served, making it the third largest auxiliary. Now, the one I haven't mentioned, but is there on that slide, is the Australian Women's Land Army, formed in July 1942. Now, the reason that it is different is because it never was officially designated as an enlisted auxiliary service. And what this meant was that its members were discharged as a civilian body and they were not eligible for the same benefits as the other women's services, and nor were they allowed to march on Anzac Day until 1985. And the thing about it is that when women were, in, when young women, there were maybe young women, were enlisting in any of these services, I really don't think they had actually paid much attention. It was just whatever was there at the time, and oh yeah, land army, oh okay, that sounds okay, or oh, the army, the service. They didn't really realise the repercussions of the particular um, service, auxiliary service that they were um, enlisting in. Until after the war, when of course they had some benefits from the army, etc., and they had to fight for their, what they were entitled to, what they were called. Now, of course, the Australian Army Nursing Service is the grand dame of the women's services, and it's been around since before World War I. 
By September 1939, over 600 nurses were registered. Within a few months of war being declared, the first groups of ANS nurses were on their way to Egypt with the 6th Division of the AIF. Throughout 1941, and after nurses were evacuated just before the siege of Tobruk, ANS nurses served through the Middle East, Crete, Greece and Crete. But by early 1943, all these ANS nurses had returned home to Australia and their units were later sent to New Guinea. Many nurses found themselves in the line of fire. 72 ANS nurses died during the war. Sister Margaret de Mesta was killed when the hospital ship Manunda was bombed in Darling Harbour in 19 February 1942. Some of you may know about her, her work. Um, over 200 people were killed during that bombing. On the 14th of May 1943, 11 ANS nurses drowned after the hospital ship Centaur, sailing northwards from Sydney to Cairns and Port Moresby, was torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese submarine off the Queensland coast. And in all, just under 3,500 nurses served in the ANS during the war. These auxiliaries gave service women access to what had been the preserve of men. Many served outside of Australia. Some were interned as prisoners of war. Some died in the line of duty, equal sacrifice to their male counterparts. And that is why we will not forget them as we count down the World War II generation. <coughs> However, we forget the fights that ex service women went through to gain recognition of their war contribution after the war. They were often marginalised. Now, not Vivian Bullwinkle. In this picture here, you can see her. She's on the left um, of the picture. And here she is marching in the uniform um, with the medals on Anzac Day in 1955. But many thousands of other women, um, their auxiliaries were demobilised as quickly as possible after the war, far quicker than any other countries um, like Britain or um, America. And women were told to go back to the laminated kitchen tables from whence they had come. The story of a group of World War II Australian ex service women and their quest to create a memorial at the Melbourne Shrine is an example of their struggles. Vivian Bullwinkle was involved in this struggle as well. In the 1940s and 50s, there was considerable tension between the RSL and the Women's Auxiliary Services. After the war, few of the women were eligible for membership of the RSL, and few women marched on Anzac Day because they felt the RSL didn't want them. So ex-World War II women's leaders like Sybil Irving, Kathleen Best and others sought to create an ex-service women memorial in the King's Domain in Melbourne. Ex-service women felt the shrine was predominantly a memorial to the men who had died and the women weren't welcome. And therefore they wanted to erect a memorial to service women who had died as a way for women to pay tribute to the sacrifices made. But the idea was supported by the male trustees of the shrine who believed that the erection of any memorial other than the shrine in the king's domain was inappropriate. So it actually took until 2010 that a women's shrine, a women's memorial garden was finally opened and I had the honour of being invited to speak at the event. And I'm sure it doesn't look like this now, but that's what it looked like in 2010. So now I'm going to um, provide you with a short biography of Vivian Baldwin. Now Vivian is different to almost all of her contemporaries. All of those 60, 66 odd thousand of, um, of uh, ex-service women, because we do know about her. Some female ex-prisoners of war have written their own books, for example, Betty Jeffries, and others have had books written about them, such as Wilma Aram Young. And I highly recommend the recent book by Lynette Silver, Angels of Mercy, and I'll return to this book um, towards the end of my lecture. However, I, I would suggest to you that Vivian Bullwinkle is in a league of her own and is arguably the most well-known Australian nurse from World War II. She has been the subject of numerous books, chapters in books, 
She was given a state funeral, as she should have done in 2000 when she passed away, age 84. And even three portraits of her have been entered into the Archibald Prize. And this one here was a, was a finalist in 1962. And I think it's a really nice, striking image of, of her. There are residential care homes named after her, chairs of nursing named after her, streets named after her. There's Vivian Bullwinkle Drive here in Kakanda. There's, there's the, um, the gardens and things that Pepper mentioned. Um, and her amazing smile beams out from the tiles that are part of a banner at the Heidelberg Rehab Hospital in Melbourne that was installed in 2019. So she's still being remembered. Um, and money is still being raised, I believe, for a statue of Vivian in the Australian War Memorial Sculpture Garden. So he is on these things take time. There are social media pages of her life story. There are documentaries, feature films. She was interviewed many, many times over the years. Hers is an iconic story of female heroism and survival. And she's probably one of the most well-known people to have been born in Kapunda. Maybe I should rephrase that and say the most well-known women to have been born in Kapunda. As we heard from Heather, Vivian was born here on the 18th of December in 1915. Her father, George Bullwinkle, had migrated to Australia in his early 30s from Essex. After, and as after working as a jackaroo, he got a clerical job at BHP on his marriage to Edith Chagall in April 1914. Vivian's brother John, Jack Fullwinkle, was born in 1920 in Broken Hill. She attended Broken Hill High School and completed her nursing training at Broken Hill District Hospital in 1938, followed by a year of midwifery. She worked at the Jesse McPherson Hospital in Melbourne from 1940 to 41 before enlisting in the ANS, Australian Army Nursing Service. And she was described as being tall, willowy, with vivid blue eyes and blonde hair. You can certainly see that in this, this portrait. And she was nicknamed Bully. A reputable high school athlete, fellow nurse and prisoner of war, Betty Jeffrey wrote in White Coolies that she was not an excitable person, any time. I think that probably um, says a lot about her character and her demeanour and how she managed to cope with um, what happened to her. So her post-war career was exemplary and yet I believe it was also very challenging. This is a well-known photograph of her testifying um, in Tokyo in 1946. I wonder just how hard it must have been for her to travel to Japan in October 1946, barely a year, just on a year, after being released from being a prisoner of war for more than three years, and to testify at the Japanese war criminal trials in Tokyo. Through the post-war period, she cared for ex-servicemen at Heidelberg Rehab Hospital and later became major in Fairfield's Infectious Diseases Hospital in Melbourne. Resigning from the Army in 1947, she rejoined the reservists in 1955, retiring in 1970 as Lieutenant Colonel. She organised a nursing scholarship scheme for Malaysian students to complete their training in Australia. She initiated a rescue mission for the Vietnamese orphans. She was president of the Australian College of Nursing and the first woman appointed as a trustee to the Australian War Memorial in 1985. And later she was the first woman warden of the West Australian State War Memorial. So this is just an indication of the roles that she, she had and the sorts of things that she became involved with through her life. Now, Trove is a wonderful, wonderful tool. I'm sure your students have discovered Trove. I don't know how he, I don't know how he worked the ball throw. It really is a magnificent institution. Um, and so one can can trace um, a lot of what she had, what she did through through newspapers. Um, she also received numerous awards for her service 
including the Royal Red Cross Medal in 1947, um, and that's um, Vivian there on the right, um, receiving an award with Matron Annie Sage. Um, she also received the Florence Nightingale Medal, which is the top award um, given by the ICRC in 1947. And her citation read, graduated from the Broken Hill District Hospital, worked during 1941 under the most difficult conditions in Malaya. She was wounded and taken prisoner. She exhibited unsurpassable courage. Her attitude has been an inspiration and a magnificent example not only to her colleagues but to all Australian women. Sounds well. Well. She was also awarded an MBE in 1973 for <coughs> service to nursing in the community and an Order of Australia in 1993 for service to the veteran and ex prisoner of war communities, to nursing, to the Red Cross, and to the community. She was involved with the Red Cross for most of her post war life. Um, including Deputy Commissioner and Nursing Advisor, and she was awarded Honorary Life Membership of the Australian Red Cross in 1992. And her name continues to be revered. For example, just in 2019, Queensland's Gallipoli Barracks renamed their, their 17th Brigade Precinct All Winkle Lines. So her memory is, um, is staying with us. She married um, in uh, 1977, and lived, she lived in Perth. Um, she died in July 2000, aged 84. However, for her entire life, after 1945, she was always the one that survived the massacre on Bangor Island. Every time you look at these um, newspapers, there's always a mention of being a survivor of a massacre. And that must have, have lent heavily on her. She could never escape that label. She was held up as one representing the best of Australian womanhood and heroism in war. And this was what her survival and her three years in captivity as a prisoner of war of the Japanese, it defined her and it motivated her for the rest of her life. She was only 29 when she was liberated returned home to Australia. She spent the next 50 years until her death working for and advocating for those colleagues and friends who did not return. So, what happened? What happened on Bank Island? And Vivian will win this remarkable smile. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this map, but I think maps are always quite useful. Um, this is Hong Kong here, Singapore down here, of course Australia. So, um, so Hong Kong, Singapore, just there for you. And Sumatra is where <coughs> So the Pacific War begins officially on the 7th of December 1941, when the Japanese attack the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. However, for Australians, the war had come much closer before then. Australians were still reeling from the information that HMS Sydney had been sunk off the west coast of Western Australia by the German raid at Cormoran on the 19th of November 1941, with all 645 men on board losing their lives. Two weeks later, Pearl Harbor is bombed. Three days after that, it was announced that the British battleship HMS Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser HMS Repulse had been sunk. These, these ships were part of the interwar defence strategy put in place by Britain to defend the Far East. Well, our, well, to defend us and our region, but to the British it's always the Far East. And it was called the Singapore Strategy and it relied on British naval support being based at Singapore and the idea that Singapore was indestructible. This was Australia's northern defence, and it went down in an afternoon with those ships. In one attack, the Japanese sent the British fleet to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean in the Far East, and the Japanese came down the peninsula, something the British said would never happen. 
The situation deteriorated through December as the Japanese swooped south through Malaya, capturing Hong Kong, where multiple atrocities occurred, including the raping and killing of nurses on what was termed Black Christmas, the 25th of December, 1941. The estimation is that around 10,000 women and girls were raped in Hong Kong in early 1942. On the 20th of January, a senior Australian medical officer, Colonel Alfred Durham, requested that the military nurses be withdrawn from Singapore. This is where Vivian Bullwinkle um, was. However, because of the number of injured soldiers and the view that Singapore was in threat, <coughs> the order was only given on the 11th of February. With knowledge of what had occurred in Hong Kong, senior command instructed all female nursing staff to evacuate, along with remaining residents, especially civilian women, children and the elderly. All Australian Army nursing service staff um, were evacuated. Six nurses left on the 10th of February on the Hua Sui and a further 60 on the Empire, Empire Star the next day. They were the lucky ones. They all returned safely to Australia. Such a lucky day. The final group of 65 nurses led by Major Drummond, including Vivian Bullwinkle, was evacuated on the Viner Brook on the 12th of February. The ultimate humiliation occurred on the 15th of February with the fall of Singapore. About 130,000 Allied soldiers became prisoners of war, including over 18,000 Australians. So here, um, <coughs> this is Singapore and the Viner Brook and other boats as well with evacuees um, sailing, sneak, sneaking down here, um, trying to get away, and this is where the minor book is sunk there. So, the minor book reached the Bannon Strait, where it was attacked by Japanese planes and quickly sank. Many were drowned, including 12 nurses. Only a handful of ships made it to safety. And it's estimated that only about one in four evacuees from Singapore survived. The remainder were either drowned, killed, or captured. And to this day, we still don't actually know the numbers of civilians that were actually um, <coughs> survived. A large group made it to shore on Banker Island and decided to surrender. Civilian women and children were dispatched to a local village and to find the Japanese who had taken the island while the nurses remained behind with the sick and the wounded. Japanese troops arrived, separated the group, and executed the men. The nurses were then ordered to walk into the sea, and the Japanese opened fire. They just swept up and down the lines, and the girls fell one after another, Vivian Bullwinkle later recalled. Shot above her left, left hip, because she was tall, if she hadn't been short of the one. Her height helped her. She fell into the sea and pretended to be dead. Vivian and a man, the badly wounded Private Kingsley, were the only survivors of the massacre. They hid out for about 12 days until eventually surrendering. Kingsley died shortly afterwards. Vivian met up with the remaining 32 Australian Army Nursing Service nurses from the Vine Brook on the 2nd of March 1942. She told them what had happened. Close friend Wilma Aran said that they accepted the news quietly, swore to silence, and never mentioned it again. So those who became prisoners of war endured, endured three and a half years of internment in Sumatra and elsewhere. The Japanese did not follow the Geneva Conventions or recognise and adhere to the principles of the Red Cross. According to Vivian Bullwinkle, the only Red Cross passes we saw were August 1944, with the Japanese purloining the rest. And I have written elsewhere about how the Australian Red Cross repeatedly attempted to send parcels to prisoners of war, how they set up a messaging service, they worked hard to get into the camps, but, but um, to little avail. Four nurses died in captivity at Muntok Camp, Banker Island. Four died at Lobok, Lingau Camp, Sumatra and 24 survived captivity, including Vivian Bullwinkle. So throughout the war, there was very little information about prisoners of war. Regarding the nurses and the massacre, the Australian
Australian public was not told they were in the dark until mid-September 1945. This is um, at least uh, three weeks, four weeks after the war had officially finished. <coughs> when the news, the news broke. The Australian Army knew their fate much earlier, in 1944, as evidenced by the service record. ABC journalist Hayden Leonard's telegrams can be found in the National Archives of Australia that have been digitised and they're interesting to read. He was the first journalist to speak for the nurses. However, the story got out of the garbled story being published on the 15th of September, a day before the nurses were rescued. With the embargo lifted, the story quickly flew around the country and the world. And by the 19th of September, 1945, the massive story was in all the newspapers. And this is just an example from um, the age of Mercury of how it was reported. The nurses who preserved their precious uniforms and were insistent that they were photographed in the uniforms when they were released. They were hospitalised for a month, full medical checks were undertaken, um, and they needed time to recover before returning home. Um, and this is a well known photograph of them. Um, uh, coming home in their, in their uniforms with lots of flowers and Vivian Sidia And this is um, another story from the Australian Women's Weekly about um, the nurses, some of the nurses who survived. Now Vivian Baldwin was not the only South Australian nurse on the beach that day. There were six others. South Australia. So of that 21 who were killed, six in South Australia. Um, oops, okay, so these are the, this is from my book, Australian Women of War, um, and these are the photographs of their enlistment. Um, so these are all the women who are on the beach with Vivian being the sole. views 
like many of the Australian population in the immediate post-war period regarding the Japanese. In November 1949, during the media controversy around whether Japan should be allowed to compete in the Melbourne 1956 Olympics, Arthur Hall, who was the Minister for Immigration, said he would not allow them to compete in Melbourne in 1956 should he still be in office. Well, I had an election and he did not. It was not um, but the RSL also opposed Japanese participation in the Melbourne Olympics. Vivian Bullwinkle was asked her opinion on that, and this is what she said. I know that we Australians are an easygoing, sport-loving nation, but surely no Australian sportsman can condone the actions of the Japs a bare five years ago in their machine-gunning of defenseless women, their calculated, fiendish fashion of our men, and the withholding of our medical supplies through sheer sadism. Now, it appears, I can't confirm, but I think that Vivian Bullwinkle may have had some sort of breakdown around this time. She certainly appeared restless and needed a change, as evidenced by that, um, that newspaper report, because there's no other evidence at all about her holding those views, or about her feeling that way. But that's how she was, that's how she felt at that time. And I think that is an indication of someone who is under extreme stress. So along with co um, ex prisoner of war friend Betty Jeffrey, she decides to travel to England in September 1950. And again, you know, this is front, this is news. It's newsworthy what Vivian Woolwinkle does. Um, and there's a picture of smiling Vivian. Um, with Betty Jeffrey and another nurse going abroad, and um, it splashed across the South Australian media. They were all, the South Australian media was always very interested in Vivian, and she described herself as a South Australian who is Victorian by adoption. Vivian and Betty were going to attend a postgraduate course in the UK on modern blood bank methods. She and Betty were presented at court along with other Australians in May 1951. And in July 1953, as part of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth <coughs> II, she led the 200-strong Australian nursing contingent. Vivian stayed in England for about three years, working at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, and as a nurse receptionist for the health section at Australian House in London, checking the health of prospective migrants to Australia. So, almost without exception, um, for much of the late 1940s and 50s, um, there were scores of media reports about Vivian Bullwinkle, and this is um, how she lived in the world. There really are scores and scores, and these media reports she's always described as the sole survivor of the massacre of Australian other nurses, or something similar. And as I said earlier, I think that this must have had an impact, even though she had this calm exterior and unflappable common sense, um, and just of getting on with life, that was very much her way. But she never forgot, and neither did, and, and, and for the first 10 years, I think it, uh, it was probably incredibly hard for her. Every year, she put an in memoriam, um, and I found a couple of them here, um, for commemorating um, the, the massacre on the 16th of February. Uh, it's sort of in memory of my former nursing colleagues who lost their lives after the fall of Singapore. And interesting, one of these, one year, here is um, Cassin as well, the family put in the memorial as well. But I think this is an indication of um, her wanting to, you know, stating publicly, I'm not here. So despite the unwavering consistency in Bullwinkle's official accounts, conflicting media reports continued to enter into the public sphere, including how the nurses shrieked and sank, which is something that some people have, have, have said about when the nurses were killed. Over the years, Vivian consistently maintained that there was no protest. Their marvellous courage prevented me from calling out when I was hit. I couldn't let them down. So she had this narrative that she that she was consistent about for um, her 
her entire life. But the other question mark is over whether the women were raped by the Japanese soldiers before being told to walk into the water and being shamed up. So, up until the 1990s, the Australian historiography of World War II was predominantly based around the use of Australian or Allied archives, English language archives. However, in the 1990s, Japanese historians began to publish in English, and they began, they brought another perspective. Yuki Kanaka, a former history professor at Hiroshima University, began working on the topic of rape in war and the, use, and the Japanese use of comfort women. He argued that comfort women, a phrase used by the Japanese imperial forces, were women, mostly foreigners, who were forced to become prostitutes, largely from Korea, China and Taiwan, but also from the Philippines and Indonesia, including Europeans. These women were effectively sex slaves. In an article published in 2019, based on his earlier books, he outlines the historiography of comfort women and how it only became subject of debate in Japan in the 1990s. Tanaka's work mainly focuses on the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal and the rape and massacre of Chinese women by the Japanese 10th Army in Nanking in December 1937. This behaviour was replicated in Hong Kong and with the nurses on Banker Island. He writes, as most of the records were burnt after the war, it's hard to ascertain the extent of military brothels in the Pacific region. However, comfort stations were established as early as 1932 in Shanghai. Comfort women were treated as military supplies, but relevant documents were destroyed or hidden at the end of the war, so it's impossible, he says, to verify the numbers, but he estimates they range from 80 to 100. European civilian women prisoners of war were also used as comfort women as Dutch woman Jean Rafa Hearn's searing memoir of 50 Years of Silence reveals. As Tarnica writes in his book Hidden Horrors, he writes a chapter about the Banker Island massacre. And he says that the nurses, and this has been corroborated elsewhere, they were in their uniforms, they had Red Cross armbands, and they had raised a Red Cross flag on the beach. He questions why the Japanese separated the Australian soldiers and the, Austra and the, the British soldiers and the Australian nurses. Why did they do that? Why did they bayonet the men on the beach and machine gun the women as they were instructed to walk into the sea? And what does this signify? And he asks the question, why were they killed differently? He suggests that Japanese soldiers knew they were violating the Geneva Convention and therefore wanted to destroy the evidence. Or did they separate the men and women with the intention of raping the women? Did Vivian Woolwinkle protect her dead colleagues from the shame of being known as victims of rape? In the immediate aftermath of the war, the Australian and British authorities, because of course you have British soldiers and the Australian nurses, they tried to find the culprits, finding that the crime was probably committed by soldiers from the 229th Regiment under the command of Lieutenant Marita Masuru. Now this was the same regiment, as I said earlier, that participated in the, invasion, in the invasion of Hong Kong before being sent to Banka Island. So was this the same group of soldiers, is the question. Lieutenant Marita Masuru had been captured by the Russians in Manchuria and was a prisoner of war until he was released and returned to Japan in 1948. He committed suicide before being interrogated. Almost all the other men in the regiment had died. So both the British and Australian investigations were stymied and no one was prosecuted. In her book on William Oram Young, published in 2003, Barbara Angel wrote that throughout their lives it was difficult to get any of the prisoners of war nurses to talk about the massacre. Once the pact of silence had been agreed, that silence became virtually unbreakable. Some things are best taken to the grave, Wilma had said. 
In a revised edition published in 2011, Angel published an appendix, The Banker Island Massacre, a hypothesis. Here, Angel states that she waited to publish when the last of the prisoners of war nurses had passed. And based on all her research and that of the others, she suggests that the nurses were not telling the full story, and that the nurses on the Banker Island Massacre could well have been raped. Most recently, in 2017, journalist Tess Lawrence wrote an article commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Banker Island Massacre. She linked the story to survivor post-traumatic stress, the treatment of women in war, and specifically the issue, issue of comfort women, and how survivors, especially in South Korea, were still trying to get justice and adequate recognition of their experiences at the hands of the Japanese soldiers. Lawrence said that she had met Vivian Woolwinkle a number of times at the Naval and Military Club and the nearby Windsor Hotel in Melbourne. Vivian told Lawrence that she had been keeping two secrets. The first was that most of us had been violated by the Japanese soldiers before being shot. The second secret was that she had wanted to put this into her statement to the war crimes tribunal, but was ordered not to by Australian officials. They may have signed the official secrets act. Now, in some quarters, this story has been dismissed as ridiculous. Why would Vivian Bullwinkle, who for decades had been so consistent in her recollection, give up her darkest and deepest secrets to somebody that she hardly knew, a journalist? And why did that person sit on that story for 17 years before she died in 2000? As a historian, I have to ask, where is the evidence? But then we come to military historian Lynette Silver's recent work. Her painstaking, forensically detailed detective analysis comes to the fore in an epilogue to her 2019 book, Angels of Mercy. Titled Unwrapping the Secret, she has left no stone unturned, and she appears to have the evidence. Evidence that includes the Japanese research that I mentioned earlier. There's also a diary of Charles Stuart Johnson, who was an Australian flight lieutenant and a prisoner of war, who describes in a paragraph of his original diary that Silver has read that on the 1st of October 1945, the recovery of Australian nurses from a prisoner of war camp up country, they all had VD and some had children. Now this paragraph was edited out when his diaries were published in 1995. Silver goes on to cite Stoker Ernest Lloyd's evidence. Because of course, the massacre occurred, but there was still survivors um, from shipwrecks floating around, coming to shore in the days afterwards, which Vivian, of course, didn't know about, wouldn't have known. And Stoker Ernest Lloyd says that he, he um, reported that the male bodies had been put into a pile, and he said, the bodies of Australian nurses and other women, they lay at intervals of a few yards in different positions and in various stages of undress, they had been shot and then bayoneted. It was shocking. And this supports William Wilding's statement, who had floated to shore after the killings. And he saw, he, he says, 10 female bodies on the beach, some scantily dressed in civilian clothing, some in nurses' uniforms, and some were naked. He examined two of the women's bodies. One had been shot, the other killed with a sword. Silver's evidence continues but the contents excised from notes made during post-war crimes investigations, dinner table conversation with a member of the Second Australian War Crimes Commission from the 1940s, who said of the Banker Island Massacre, there are some things about that case that I had to keep secret and I cannot talk about. And with most of the official files and interrogation reports destroyed, they may, they may not. However, there is also the forensic evidence carried out concerning the angle of the bullet hole in Vivian Bullwinkle's armed uniform that is now held in the Australian War Memorial. And the verdict is from the forensic scientist that she entered the water with her bodice undone and open to the waist. Conclusion. I'm concluding. We know so much more now than we did about this tragic story. Who knows what more research may be conducted and what 
more evidence might come forward that will help us to find out what really happened 80 years ago on that remote, remote beach in Sumatra during the dark days of World War II. In this instance, all the witnesses have died, but it is the job of historians to continue their work, to continue to pull together the evidence, to analyse and assess new information as it comes to hand. That is our job, that's what we do. Australians have been obsessed with this story of the massacre of 21 Australian nurses by the Japanese. Vivian Woodwind's heroic survival since it was announced to the public in September 1945. It was one of the worst war atrocities for women in uniform and wearing the Red Cross armbands to die in a way that was unthinkable, especially for family and friends of the victims. Yet to be raped was a fate worse than death. Social attitudes at the time, the fear and loss of reputation, means that the conspiracy of silence that bound Vivian and the other prisoners of war which she told, keeping that secret until their deaths. In 2019, when I was in Japan at the University of Tokyo, a visiting chair of Australian studies, there was a film called Sen Sen Sujenzo, um, which is about comfort women, released by Niki Tazaki, and I recommend it to those of you who are interested in this topic. It was highly controversial in Japan. Evidence is needed that this is still a real and raw issue for Japan and for Korea. It hasn't been resolved, the issue of the country women, with many South Koreans still dissatisfied with their treatment. So in many ways, the story of Vivian Woolwing and what has happened on that beach is part of a longer conversation, I think, that we need to have about war the role of women in war, the gendered nature of war, how rape is used as a weapon, the secrets, the shame, the survivors, and those that do not survive. But it's also about our history, Australian history, and how our history is shaped, and how it changes over time. With each generation, we ask different questions, we have different perspectives, we see our past, Just a query about uh, nurses in the Second World War. Uh, I'm familiar with the Montevideo Maru incident. 
and uh, there is a contingent of nurses on that boat that, and they will perish with, well, there's 1,008 Australian soldiers and nurses on that boat that will perish when it was sunk by an American torpedo mm -hmm. off of the Philippines. And, um, and they were involved in the overrun of, of Rabaul. Lark Force was made up from the 2nd Battalion, and quite a few of those soldiers were from South Australia. And, um, and many of them were bayoneted and decapitated at Toll Plantation and other places in the area. Do not like to live there, that's all. <laughs> and um, and uh, but the nurses there, I'm not sure how much recognition they had, because they suffered you know, terribly and then to be locked in the hold to a ship that was sunk and just perished at sea would have been just horrific. I think so, and the thing that I don't think you really realised, and there's a whole really interesting research set of research questions, is um, about civilians. What happened to the civilians being evacuated from <coughs> Singapore and Hong Kong? And I think they just have no idea. They don't know. People just disappeared from something with war. Um, Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that there's quite a lot of um, work on, on, um, on that sort of thing. But that's where this is actually quite unusual. Like, for something, I mean, even um, with the ship being, uh, being you know, hit by Allied friendly fire, um, this, was, this, was, this was something that, you know, it is, is unusual in that context. Um, I think, but you know, the historians do look at it. But the fact of being able to open up to other, to this, you know, to, to be able to open up the Japanese archives really gives us a wonderful different perspective. And it's really important, I think, to have that exchange. Um, because what comes out of that is that recognition that um, war is evil, war is bad, and, and we, all, we all behave the same, exactly. unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. Um, set up and put this on and also some fruits and nibbles that will be um, available.